declare the meeting open to the public now from this point. The mic is on. So when we're in public session, can I remind members that the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online as well? And can I remind members at this point about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? So in terms of apologies, both Mark Durkin and Mike Nesbitt have provided apologies for today's meeting. Um, do members have any other apologies? Chair, can we just, um, as a committee, send her something as well as Mother's death. That was the next. So, All right, go, okay. If everyone is is happy on behalf of the committee, we'd like to pass our condolences to Mike Nesbitt following the passing of his mother, Brenda Nesbitt. If we can do that for me. Everyone yeah, agreed. Yeah. So, um, an item: public access to Parliament buildings. If members can refer to the table papers, we have a letter here from the Speaker Alec Maskey. Um, to committee chairpersons. Members will be aware that from 9 p.m. yesterday, Wednesday the 18th of March, the Speaker Assembly Commission has restricted access to the building to essential business users only. This means that the general public will not be permitted access to the building and to the public galleries in the chamber and committees. Subject to the usual procedures in relation to closed sessions, any public sessions of the committee will continue to be broadcast live for the public to view. Whilst this is not ideal, the Speaker of the House and the Assembly Commission has taken this decision in the interest of public safety and procedures will continue to be reviewed on a daily basis. And obviously, as the COVID-19 situation um, progresses, th things will have to be reviewed. Um, can I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 5th of March, which are pages 5 to 9 of the meeting pack? Are members content with the minutes or are there any matters arising? Agreed. 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 Brilliant. So, um, just one issue arising out of uh, the last meeting. At the last meeting, members discussed the opportunity to appoint deputies or substitute members to attend meetings in their place if they are unable to attend. And members at that point felt that it was appropriate to return to their, their own party whips to decide who these people are. Uh, this can help to ensure that there is a quorum, which is likely to be particularly important for this committee, given that it has seven members and a quorum of five. So, obviously, today we're at that quorum. Um, members should be aware of the potential disadvantage. The deputies may not have been present at previous ad hoc meetings and may not have heard oral evidence or been aware of the rationale regarding previous ad hoc committee decisions. If the committee wishes to allow the nominations of deputies, which I think we were content to do at the last meeting, um, each ad hoc committee member will be entitled to appoint one substitute member to attend their place. Are members content to permit each committee member to appoint one substitute member to attend in their place? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, if you if you want to advise the ad hoc committee staff of the name of the deputy you would like to appoint, you can you can do this following the meeting or now if you wish. It's up to you. Yeah, I, I called to see the committee clerk during the week just to advise that Kelly Armstrong will be the alliance um, deputy. Okay. Um, huh? I get your armage on and Sinead. Sinead, or, yeah. Hers. Yeah. We'll just advise at a later date if that's okay. That's fine. So now we have a briefing from Reyes. We'll now move on to agenda item six, which is a briefing from the Assembly's Research and Information Service. Uh, Michael Potter will now brief the committee on his research paper, which is at pages 12 to 24 of the pack. And Michael, you're welcome to the committee meeting today, um, if you want to proceed. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was asked to prepare a paper on the key issues for a Bill of Rights on Northern Ireland. I'm very aware that there are members around the table uh, who have been personally involved in the Bill of Rights, uh, sorry, the, um, uh, the Bill of Rights process and the Bill of Rights forum. Um, there's been a huge amount of material written and discussed on this topic, as you know. There's literature from the 1970s and 1980s, and much written around the time of the Belfast Agreement, substantial material from the forum, evidence uh, from the uh, uh, Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, material from the Human Rights Commission, a broad academic literature and much material from community-based organisations, not least from the Human Rights Consortium. So I don't intend to repeat all this uh, material um, and certainly haven't done in, in the paper. So, uh, but, but just to dis distill all that down to a number of key issues that have arisen over the years. Um, the paper is intentionally broad in scope, as there is considerable potential depth in any of the areas raised here. Uh, the intention is merely to sketch out the landscape at this point, and members can advise where they would like further research. 
I don't intend to cover the background and, and, and the, con uh, the background and context, which is summarised uh, in the paper there. I've chosen in the paper to start in 1998, but I'm very well aware that processes go ma ma back much further than that, uh, uh, to the 1970s for some. Uh, for others, for 1679, 1689, uh, and, and earlier than that. So, <laughs> so uh, it, it's, uh, uh, it's up to the individual. But I'll go straight on to the key issues themselves that are in the, the paper. The first one uh, is defining uh, rights, what rights are, uh, at the risk of teaching anyone's grandmother to suck mm. eggs in, in the current company, just, just to outline that, um, that, that there are, I suppose that there are three main uh, areas of rights that, that are contested, uh, and it's acknowledged they're contested. One is that of universal or absolute human rights that apply to everyone, uh, such as those in the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, such as the right to life or, or right not to be tortured. Uh, secondly, there are rights that are qualified by virtue of being a member of a group, such as citizenship rights, voting rights, that kind of thing. Uh, and then there are rights specific to individuals, such as contractual rights. Now, bills of rights would only deal with the first two, really, but the boundary between those two uh, is also contested. As in the paper, it's not intended to go into specific rights, but the nature of rights has also been disputed. Some rights might be considered to be aspirational, where they refer to something that's not read readily available to all, or where resources are insufficient to, to fulfil a right, uh, but, are, uh, but they are ne nevertheless desirable. So the second key point um, is rights and alternatives. Uh, this is simply a matter of whether an entitlement is best achieved through a legally binding right or whether there are alternative routes such as legislation, policy or the enforcement of an existing entitlement or allocation of resources. The UK Government response to the Human Rights Commission advice contains a lot of examples of this. Uh, the Commission felt that the UK Government was missing the point. So, uh, the third key point, uh, particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. The Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland is to have rights in addition to those in the European Convention that reflect the specific circumstances of Northern Ireland. The consideration here is whether they are circumstances that are unique to Northern Ireland or whether they are more acute in Northern Ireland, in which case the degree to which Northern Ireland differs from other places and the reasons for that, which is open to discussion. Some considerations might reflect the legacy of the conflict, for example, others' geographic location, uh, etc. There have been many debates in the past in relation to what constitute particular circumstances, but clearly there have been additional factors since the UK withdrawal from the EU uh, that make Northern Ireland different, being the only point of land contact uh, with an external EU border and recent questions with regard to citizenship. Uh, the nature of a Bill of Rights... Uh, bills of rights have been config config configured in lots of different ways. So, for example, they could be a list of rights in a constitution, as in France, a list of rights and a set of principles that are not actually rights themselves but give context for interpretation of certain rights. A list of rights that include rights that uh, may not be immediately attainable and are therefore aspirational, such as in South Africa, uh, and a list of rights in legislation, as in uh, New Zealand. The UK route has been through uh, legislation. Uh, the Irish constitution consists of a set of uh, principles and a list of rights. Uh, there's also a question of where such a Bill of Rights would sit. Is it to be within the competencies of the devolved institutions uh, or at another level such as Westminster or, or somewhere sitting above that? Uh, enforcement. Once in place, enforcement methods will depend on the form of the Bill of Rights takes. Um, there are three considerations here. Uh, one is the form of entrenchment of rights. For example, can courts strike down legislation? Uh, can legislation stand notwithstanding being contrary to a Bill of Rights? Uh, is a Bill of Rights an interpretive aid for the courts? Uh, secondly, a venue for enforcement. Uh, is this to be through the regular courts? Is uh, a division of the High Court, perhaps? Um, a dedicated human rights court or a constitutional court? Uh, or a specific human rights tribunal? And thirdly, monitoring. Is monitoring to be left to courts alone? Uh, or would an existing body like the Human Rights Commission or other commissions in concert, depending on the rights in the Bill of Rights, uh, uh, be o overseeing that? Uh, or would an assembly committee uh, do so? Then there's the question of amendment. Uh, again, the nature of a Bill of Rights would determine the method of amendment. If it's legislation, would it be through the normal legislative process for majority in Parliament uh, or, or the Assembly? If it's to be more like a constitution, 
Um, usually the majority of a legislature uh, plus a referendum, as with the Irish Constitution, or alternatively a two-thirds majority, as you would get in other constitutions around the world. So finally, just on future-proofing, um, a number of questions have ari arisen uh, in more recent years that have not been part of the original discussion on a Bill of Rights, and key among those uh, are the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol states that there will be no diminution of rights after the UK withdraws from the EU. So is that just about existing rights, uh, or would that include any rights that are added after withdrawal through a Bill of Rights process? Um, what would be the position of a Bill of Rights in any potential uh, further constitutional change? What would be the relationship between a Bill of Rights and any uh, UK Bill of Rights, or indeed any other uh, um, uh, charter or Bill of Rights uh, on these islands? And, and what additional rights might be needed in a Bill of Rights that reflects the changes in circumstances resulting from the UK leaving the EU? So uh, I'll leave it there uh, and take any questions or perhaps views on what directions the research might go to best support your work here. Thank you, uh, Michael. Um, uh, thank you very much for your briefing. I think I'm fairly content that that's a, a good summarisation of, of the issues that we're facing. And obviously, these are the things that we're going to be working on as a, as a committee. And maybe our next uh, briefing will have a bit more detail about the, the scope. If members have questions. Not at this stage. Right. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Paula. It was today with the. Um, Said there about the. Sorry, I'm get find the page here. Sorry. All right. All right. I was to do with the different ways in which the likes of India, New Zealand, and. Yes. Have you any comment then in terms of actually enforcement and how it actually works in practice in terms of um, administering it through the executive or through like a legislature like here? Um. Uh, again, it depends on on what you decide to have as a, as a uh, as a format for a bill of rights. So uh, the, the UK tradition is is for for legislation. If if that's the route that's taken, then then that will be around whichever uh, level that would be, whether that's through assembly legislation or Westminster legislation. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm not sure where the intended parameters are just just yet in terms of that process. Um, if it's to be more of a, a bit of rights no, that, 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 that sits above legislation or elsewhere in legislation, uh, then, then there'll be decisions around uh, whether that can be amended uh, or even done away with uh, through whether it will take uh, a referendum uh, of, of the, the people involved, people of Northern Ireland, um, or, or whether that's just something like a two-thirds majority. Um, that it, it really depends on the form that you decide on for a Bill of Rights in the end, uh, as, as to how that's enforced and, and how, that, uh, how that might be amended and where it sits. Yeah. I think the point's really about how, as you say, how things can be amended and how yeah. difficult yeah. and how cumbersome things can be, but I suppose in some ways we don't want yeah. us to be able to amend a Bill of Rights easily anyway, so it's more just about the processes within the countries that yeah. have one at the minute. About Sure. Well, certainly in, in the UK, um, you, you, you have the, the, the Human Rights Act that, that, that sits in legislation, so that can be repealed uh, if, uh, if, um, if, if Parliament decides to do so, and that will be the same in, in, uh, in New Zealand, uh, if, if that's the route that's taken, if, if it's just about legislation. Uh, it, all, it all depends on, on, on where the power is. It's much more difficult um, in constitutions, for example, the, the, the French constitution or, or the, the Grundgesetz in, in Germany, in that uh, you actually need uh, all, all of the lender to agree for, for the Grundgesetz to, 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 be, uh, to be amended. But th this is a much smaller um, piece of ground, uh, I suppose. Um, a comparable uh, territory might be Kosovo. Uh, they, they have a constitution there, and that requires a two-thirds majority in order to amend the constitution in any way. Uh, because, like here, there's, there's only a single legislature, uh, so uh, that, that would be the main check to that. You need two thirds. Yeah. And, and would they have a voting system like we would have in the assembly here, or, or at the minute the Alliance Party or, or other? You know, in terms of the qualified. The, the, this is quite interesting. Okay. Uh, don't, don't start me on Costco. This okay. is really interesting. But but no, they they, um, they they do have a certain qualified majority on constitution issues. So they call it uh, laws of vital interest. So that would include any votes on the constitution. So um, there, there are 120 seats. 100 of those would be to. Uh, basically Albanian parties, mm -hmm. 
example, there are 10 seats reserved for Serbs and 10 for other minorities, and you would have to have um, a, a weighted majority. You'd have to have the, the Serbs and, and minorities agree to any change in the constitution. So there's some similarity, but it's not directly. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I think that's an important point. That Albania is, or sorry, Kosovo is 90 percent of one national identity. That's, right. that's why it's an independent country. <laughs> um, in terms of the, the, the system you outlined, I mean, Germany is a federal republic, yeah. and that's why it's quite like the American. I mean, they're, the Americans basically loaned them their federal system after the Second War, and that's why it's it's structured in, in that way. I suppose ultimately, this everything here is an instrument of statute from Westminster. So ultimately, Westminster could, in the morning if they chose, legislate that the Assembly doesn't exist anymore, that the Scottish Parliament doesn't exist anymore, the Welsh Assembly doesn't exist anymore. We all exist by virtue of statute going through Westminster. That's how things are done in this country. So, I mean, I think that's just an observation. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mm. Well, right. I'm not going to take anybody's time up observing or speculating, so thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks. So we can now move on to our next uh, briefing, if we want to take our ease for a wee minute and get the thing set up. So, members, the next item is a briefing from the Human Rights Commission, and um, the clerk has provided a memo that you can find uh, between pages 35 and 38 at the start of this uh, briefing pack or the papers that have been provided by the Commission. Can I welcome Les Allenby and David Russell um, to, to present? And uh, when you're ready. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, good afternoon, and look, thanks for the early invitation. And um, uh, Commission's hope that this is the first of um, a wider engagement with the committee. Um, we'd like to be as useful and constructive a resource to you and uh, your officials as we can. Um, and to that end, we're in your hands in terms of um, how you can make the best use of our experience and knowledge and, and expertise. Um, the Commission is and remains committed to seeing a Bill of Rights enacted for Northern Ireland in line with the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Um, and um, hopefully you can draw uh, on us alongside the independent um, advisors and other resources that you will hopefully have at your disposal. And in time, we'd be happy to provide general or bespoke briefings. So more than happy if there are specific aspects of a Bill of Rights, um, I think we have in-house the um, ability to do that. Whether we always have the resources to do it is another matter and, and still to be, uh, is still in the melting pot. Um, I thought um, we would start this afternoon from first principles and the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And then I'll ask David to say something about the advice and the work we've done um, to date, as David has been around and has the institutional memory a little longer than me. And then to say something about the value of a Bill of Rights, and then really to take any questions you have around some of the issues that we'll, that we'll touch on. So if that meets your needs, so, uh, and I'll be relatively um, uh, brief. Um, the Bill of Rights provisions are contained in the Rights, Safeguards and Equal Opportunity section of the agreement. And uh, apologies for, for reading it out, um, but it actually bears interrogation. Um, and in particular, what it states is that the Commission will be invited to consult and to advise on the scope or defining in Westminster legislation, rights supplementary to those in the European Convention, to reflect the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland, drawing on appropriate, as appropriate on international instruments and experience. And these additional rights are to reflect the principles of mutual respect for the identity and ethos of both communities and parity of esteem, and taken together with the European Convention on Human Rights to constitute a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. Now, there's a fair bit to unpack simply in those few short sentences, um, and among them are 
um, uh, for example, um, the question of what are rights supplementary to those in the European Convention, what are the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland, and probably an issue which I'm happy to, to, to deal with in questions, are we looking at 1998 in ASPIC or are we looking at 2020 and where we are today? Personally, I think it's clearly the latter, but there's obviously an issue to, um, to discuss around, um, around that. Um, what are the appropriate international ex instruments and experience? Um, so those are just three of a number of issues that we would be happy to explore in the Q&A session. But I recognise that even starting and understanding what the parameters are before you dive in and start looking at individual rights is, is going to be... So I'm going to pause at that stage, ask David to say something about the history of uh, the advice that we've given to date, and then I'll come back to what's the value of, of the Bill of Rights and then take questions from there. Thanks. Um, great to be here. Um, this could be really long going through everything that's taken place to date, to be quite honest, so I'm going to go through it at a gallop. Um, and I'm sure, well, I know mo most of you are probably fully aware of a lot of the, the detail behind the process already. So, um, uh, the process of the Commission started in 2000 after the agreement. Um, there were 650 formal submissions provided to the Commission during the period between then and 2008 through multiple iterations of a, a, a decade almost long process. Um, Eleven pamphlets were created um, on specific areas that were distributed across Northern Ireland. Uh, there's 400 community facilitators trained up by the Commission that had engaged at a community level during the period. Uh, Human Rights Consortium was created during the period in 2000. Uh, between 2006 and 2008, the Commission established the Bill of Rights Working Group. There's 54 internal meetings um, and lots of material that resides in the Commission with regards to the content of those meetings. Then at the same time in 2006, as you should be aware, the St Andrews Agreement established the Bill of Rights Forum. Um, the forum sat, chaired by Chris Sidoti, former Human Rights Commissioner from the Australian National Human Rights Institution, um, and produced its final report in March in 2008. At that point, the Commission was already engaged internally, received the forum's report, um, and as you'll know, there was a variety of reviews, no consensus uh, achieved amongst the forum itself. Uh, the Commission then uh, confirmed, um, committed to providing its advice by the end of the year. Uh, commissioners worked hard. Uh, in June, they published this document, um, and I'm not sure whether committee members have it or not, but I will certainly provide it to you. It was uh, the methodology that the Commission used to determine the particular circumstances. Um, uh, and that was put out and made public before the Commission finalised its approach to make sure that if there was any dissent at that point um, from anyone that the Commission could take account of it. There, there wasn't at that stage um, and the Commission worked the, the provisions of the specific rights that eventually appeared in December of that year through the test. Um, I'm sure you will get an opportunity to, to, to look at that yourselves. Um, it was completed in December of that year. Um, it deals with substantive rights but it also deals with some of the issues that Michael has just identified there about entrenchment and enforcement, where it sits in relation to the Human Rights Act, um, given that the provisions of the, the mandate was the European Convention Plus. As you know, the Convention for the Purposes of UK Law is the 1998 Human Rights Act, and how those two things would interact with each other. Um, then, following the provision of the device, Northern Ireland Office obviously responded. Um, uh, Basically, the UK government's view at the time was that two of the provisions were relevant to particular circumstances, as opposed to the substantive number that the Commission um, had provided in its advice. Uh, but there was no view expressed from memory with regards to the, the technical aspects of the Bill of Rights, entrenchment, enforcement, where it would sit, the role of the courts, um, how it would interact with um, existing legal protections. Uh, since then, the Commission has provided some other stuff into the public domain, including which we have provided you copies of sort of fact and fiction around yeah. bills of rights generally, 
um, which tries to deal with, um, I would describe it more or less as a myth-busting exercise, things that the bill tried to do, things that it didn't do. Uh, the Commission, as you'll be aware, for a long time, and we're, we're glad to see the committee haven't been created, because our view is um, the advice was provided under the mandate, so at one level the Commission's mandate for that part of the Good Friday Agreement is complete, and it does sit properly in the political domain, in essence, to take anything forward. So we're delighted that the committee has established, and as Les said, um, the next process really for us now, I think our role is um, to serve you the best we can, to see where the process will go. Okay, well, <clears throat> if I can come back to um, what is the value of, um, of a Bill of Rights, um, sometimes feels a bit like um, uh, Life of Brian, what have the Romans ever done for us? Well, what have human rights ever, uh, ever done for us? Um, I think our starting point is the vast majority of countries in the world either have a constitution or um, a Bill of Rights. Uh, in countries with a common law system, for example, um, the UK and Australia as a whole are relative outliers, um, though Australia has examples of um, its state territories have re effectively regional bills of rights, um, some of which may be worth looking at um, in the Northern Ireland context. Um, but of course, just because other countries um, have constitutions or bills of rights is not uh, an argument, frankly, of it on its of itself that's sufficient to uh, to commend it. Um, the role played by most countries' Bill of Rights is to set out certain fundamental rights and values. It usually also addresses a process for addressing violations and making it difficult to set, such, uh, set aside such rights and values. Um, but as Michael outlined earlier, there are a number of ways of doing this. Um, I think and one of the things that the Commission was very good uh, in its um, processes was uh, an educative process. We think any document that we eventually end up with should go beyond being a document for lawyers to pour over. It potentially is part of a wider educative process, a tool for all of us in society to understand more effectively what are our rights and our responsibilities and what is expected of us and, and the role that we play. Um, <clears throat> I think it's important to say we're not starting from a blank canvas. There are a number of countries that you can draw on or experience both those in post-conflict societies, for example, South Africans' Bill of Rights, but also those who, whose, whose Bill of Rights and ch subsequent Charter of Rights has not arisen as a result of, of conflict, and Canada is a, an example there. Um, I mentioned earlier that there are federal Bills of Rights, for example, in Australia. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing to say um, initially, I think, is we can also look closer to home, for example. So both Scotland and Wales are currently doing work and have done some work and continuing to work on ways to apply international human rights treaty standards more readily into law within their devolved responsibilities. So there are examples that we think you can draw on um, there as well. Um, we think that international human rights standards have a value because they are universal. Um, they were not developed um, looking at the island of Ireland uh, and Northern Ireland in mind. Um, uh, and they have the virtue that in many cases almost every country in the world has signed up to them. Uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is a good example where everybody bar the United States has signed up to uh, the CRC. Um, in the United States case, that's because signing up would force it to end capital punishment on 16 and 17 year olds in, in some federal states and the, in the federal system they have. The UK has signed up to a number of important international standards governing freedom from discrimination based on gender, on race, on disability, for example, recognizing economic and social and cultural rights civil and political rights, freedom from torture. Um, and it's important to say that the UK currently has a dualist system. And what we mean by that is that treaties are ratified uh, by the UK government um, and are expected to be adhered to, but they're not normally justiciable 
of themselves, although the courts will take them into, into account to a degree, uh, until um, those treaties have been agreed by Parliament in, in Westminster. So the UK government can sign up to them, but if we want to, to make them justiciable, it has to be through Westminster. And that's in effect what was done through a regional human rights instrument, the European Convention on Human Rights, which was incorporated into domestic law by Parliament through the Human Rights Act. Um, and those other treaties are, that aren't um, justiciable are still subject to scrutiny by UN international treaty and, re and also regional treaty monitoring bodies who issue what is effectively a school report with concluding observations and recommendations quite often says, uh, looks at the UK as a whole, could do better, but recognises where progress has been made and also um, points out where there is work still to be done. Um, it's also important to look at economic and social rights in that the um, process of economic and social rights is a progressive one, so issues like right to housing, right to work, right to health, uh, and the attainment of the highest standards of health, is a recognition that you're on a journey as um, countries who sign up to that. The idea is that you should eventually get to the highest um, attainable standards. There's the concept of no retrogression. In other words, you should not normally be going in the wrong direction, save in, in very, very specific circumstances. So there is a difference between some rights which are absolute, the right not to be tortured, etc. There are other rights that are qualified, even within the European Convention. The right to family life is a good example. Um, the state can intervene to take children into care, but it must have a legal framework and it must satisfy a number of, of conditions before it does so. Um, and economic social, and social rights are recognised as, um, as being on a journey in international law. Um, and when you interpret them within, for example, the Convention and the Human Rights Act, there's a clear understanding that um, while uh, countries have a margin of appreciation, a discretion as to how to implement um, those rights, um, and while in terms of non-discrimination that discretion is relatively narrow, in terms of wider economic and social rights it's within the parameters of having a considerably greater discretion. Um, and it's also important to say <clears throat> something about what a Bill of Rights isn't. Um, it's not the panacea for all societal legal ills, so it should not conform to the commissions, civil societies, political parties or anybody else's wish lists. That's not what a Bill of Rights is designed to be. It's not about a fundamental shift of power away from elected politicians to unelected judges. And despite occasional rhetoric to the contrary, I believe the experience actually of the Human Rights Act bears that out. So there are a number of things I think it's important that sometimes cause concerns um, <coughs> around democratic accountability, etc. We see a Bill of Rights sitting perfectly comfortably within the kind of um, executive judiciary uh, and legislature and that kind of tripartite um, uh, UK uh, constitutional um, approach. And then finally, perhaps before we then take any questions, I've always considered a Bill of Rights to be a bit like um, contracts of employment and job descriptions at work. And what I mean by that is that when something's going well in work, you don't tend to grab those documents and start reading them and interrogating them in great depth. Um, but when things go badly, that's the time when you, you tend to look at those documents. I think a Bill of Rights um, is potentially uh, the same. At times of economic prosperity and political stability, a Bill of Rights tends to recede into the background. It's when there are troubled economic and political times that a Bill of Rights comes into its own. And I think for um, the long-term well-being of this society, one of the things that we should do is ensure that we have a Bill of Rights um, uh, rather than have to try and wait until we reach 
such difficult economic and political times where we have to start trying to deal with some of the issues that would arise in a Bill of Rights on the hoof. So for durability, this is, I think, an important opportunity for us to um, produce something in line with the uh, Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Thank you very much um, for your presentation and I suppose I, I want to start, I don't want to, to labour the point, I know this was an introductory briefing and obviously with everything that's going on at the minute in terms of COVID-19 and what we've got happening, I, I don't think there's a necessity for us to have a, a long and drawn out conversation um, and obviously I from, personally from my own perspective I know you're coming at this from a rights based approach which is yeah. the, the view that I would have as well. Um, bear in mind that we have seen some progress since 2008 in terms of rights granted here in the north that previously were denied. I just have a small question around our exit from the EU and what the implications of that are going to be in terms of if, if the north needs European human rights plus according to our special circumstances. Are there worries that you have around, I know that there have been some fears have been outlined in terms of identity and movement of people and, and some of the things that we've seen in recent times as a result of Brexit? Um, yeah, let, let me give you two, two, um, two examples um, that have arisen as a result of, um, of the decision of the UK to leave the EU. Um, one's particularly interesting given the, the history of um, Bill of Rights. One is the, um, ident the birthright and identity provisions contained within the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. So uh, the idea that um, uh, people of Northern Ireland should be able to identify as uh, British or Irish or both, effectively without kind of ad adverse uh, consequences. Um, and I suppose that's been thrown into sharp relief at one level by the decision to leave the EU. We'll publish next week without much fanfare given the circumstances that we're in. Two bits of work. Uh, one is um, a look at how UK immigration and nationality law, for example, which assumes that everybody in Northern Ireland is born British, um, how a legal analysis of how you can make that law consonant and consistent with the uh, Belfast Good Friday um, agreement. Um, given the kind of issues that have been raised around that. The converse, uh, um, one of the provisions in the EU withdrawal agreement is um, uh, the idea that people in Northern Ireland uh, who identify as Irish will retain their EU uh, law rights. Uh, again, that doesn't seem to us to sit very easily with the Good Friday Agreement birthright provisions. So we're interrogated in that piece of work. Um, again, how does that um, uh, stack up in terms of what those rights are, what the EU citizenship rights are? How does that fit with the, with the Belfast Good Friday Agreement? Now, the Commission, in its advice in 2008, uh, one of the areas, one of the few areas that the Northern Ireland Office came back in a consultation document about was a recognition that the birthright provision should be put into a Bill of Rights. Um, and I suspect if we'd done that 10 years ago, some of the issues that we're interrogating next week um, may well have been, um, had to have been resolved. So it's an example of what I would call the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland, the identity provisions, um, where a Bill of Rights um, can play a role. The second area is the, again, uh, we, no doubt you'll have a debate about whether the particular circumstances, as I say, is frozen in aspic in 1998 or whether we're looking at 2020. It seems to me that in practical and realistic terms you have to look at where we are now rather than, than almost artificially where we were then. I'm very mindful of the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland is not something you can simply skate conveniently over. You've got to, you've got to take it um, seriously. But one of the issues is clearly around um, uh, the kind of... Uh, there are certain er issues in terms of freedom of movement, etc., um, that simply are very unlikely to apply in the rest of the UK, but will apply because of the land border. The example I've given in, in other circumstances is uh, people clearly commute both north-south and south-north every day. They use childcare and other services. Um, 
access to those services, for example, for people on low incomes and around the rules that, that are provided in domestic UK law, assumed that everybody used childcare within the UK that was accredited within the UK except for forces bases. Well, without EU law, for, um, that, that would become an issue. Now, there are people, I'm sure, who commute from London to Paris, um, uh, London to Berlin or whatever, but very few of those are low paid. There are people who cross the border either way each day who are low paid. So exiting the EU, the land border, is likely to give rise to some issues, uh, again, which look to me to be um, worthy of the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. So um, those are the kinds of issues that, that we could already see. Um, I think some of them might have been resolved if the original advice from the Commission had actually been enacted in the Bill of Rights. The other, the other thing in terms of EU withdrawal, which is, we we'll want to consider, is um, at, at the minute the principal domestic legal instrument for the protection of human rights is the Human Rights Act. Um, but once we've entered, gone through the transition process and the UK has left the EU, the, 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 legal, the legal framework will be different here for the protection of rights from the rest of the UK. So ourselves, alongside the Equality Commission, will become a dedicated mechanism to ensure no diminution of rights under the relevant provisions of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Um, that includes the competence, as you know, of the Assembly changing from community law to all the rights that have been transferred through the, the last withdrawal a, a withdrawal piece of legislation prior to the withdrawal bill itself. Um, but significantly, uh, there will be a duty to keep pace in this jurisdiction with <coughs> EU law on the six core non-discrimination and equality directives. And it strikes me as it would be eminently sensible and quite timely for to have a domestic instrument, which a Bill of Rights should consider, um, in UK law, which is what it will be, that recognises that distinction. If you like, from a rights perspective, in, in legal terms, particular circumstances um, are going to be different and recognised as being such once we get past December of this year. Thank you. Um, I've got Paula and then Carl, if other members want to indicate. Um, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to come um, to probably the most difficult question, the elephant really in the room, is around how any advice you can give to us from the start around how we are going to reach consensus, because the last thing we want is two years from now that we are done all this work and taken all this evidence, and then how do we then, as an assembly with so many different views, so just a, just a bit of advice maybe on the con consensus building. Um, this week there were two JRs, I think it was really around the education, I don't necessarily want to comment on those per se, but how would a Bill of Rights then sit within you know, challenging ministerial decisions, which are probably more socio-economic rights? And then the last one, was, again, was quite contemporary then about COVID-19. We had at Health Committee this morning a briefing um, regarding a request for some of the current regulations just to be lessened a bit, just to cope with the emergency. So how would you factor um, extreme times into the Bill of Rights then that you're not degrading human rights, but um, you're, you're able to maintain dignity for people? OK. Um, <clears throat> Oh, that I could have a um, <coughs> wave a wand and, and uh, create uh, political consensus. But to be um, serious, I think the advice um, Commission would give would be to take your time in doing this work, to build up your knowledge and understanding. Um, I, I understand this mandate is a relatively shortish period. But my advice would not be to try and jump in and find an answer within six months and set yourself a goal of we must produce a document in a very short space of time. That seems to me that it will make uh, life difficult. I think you need to look at the work that's been done elsewhere, look at it with open eyes from whatever perspective, political perspective and political party you come from, um, because there is a lot of work out there already. I'm mindful of you don't want to be completely drowned, frankly, in a, in a sea of, of material. But as I said earlier, the fact that Scotland has done some very interesting things around a rights-based approach 
and about looking at international treaties, etc. Um, Wales has done things. Um, I think you can draw on models elsewhere that would be useful. I think some of the mo some of the particularly difficult issues. I think it was kind of um, hinted at by the chair. You know. Are no longer. I mean, I remember the Bill of Rights process and many of the kind of particularly difficult issues around reproductive rights, etc., were that were difficult discussions. Some of those have gone. There are still some difficult issues around, but I think the the lay of the land is is slightly more propitious. But I think you take your time. You um, actually look at what difference the Bill of Rights has made in places. I think part of this is about having a realistic ambition. I think, candidly, and I was probably guilty of this, in particularly the first Bill of Rights, there was a sense in which um, great um, expectations that a Bill of Rights would, you know, all, all the issues that everybody had would suddenly be thrown into a Bill of Rights and resolved. Um, I think now we're in a better place in, in terms of where we are to have realistic expectations about what a Bill of, a bill of Rights is part of a wider societal approach to these things. It's, it complements the need for um, uh, politics to work effectively um, rather than it's the replacement of politics working effectively. So take your time would be my, um, I think, uh, um, and build up, hopefully, as a committee, um, a set of relationships uh, where you can have you know, um, candid discussions and disagreements in ways where you, you've got a good understanding of, of what the issues are in, in, in Bill of Rights terms. Quickly on the other two, judicial review, socioeconomic rights. Um, I think <clears throat> uh, sometimes there's the notion that somehow Bills of Rights, the Human Rights Act, ends up with judges somehow running the country through um, the decisions that they make. Um, I have to say, when you step back and reflect, <coughs> that isn't actually the... the um, for two reasons. One, judges are very cautious in terms of entering into um, decision and policy making. Um, so to give you, to give you examples, I mean, you'll have no doubt before you're in the, um, the Assembly next week, the issues around um, mitigations and, for example, uh, bedroom tax, the benefit cap, the benefit cap has been twice has been to uh, the Supreme Court around challenges um, and has not succeeded uh, in stopping the ben you know, benefit cap in its tracks. Yes, the bedroom tax in, in Britain has been modified in a number of quite significant ways, but again wasn't stopped in its tracks. The kinds of tests um, in terms of the discretion around um, you know, manifestly un uh, unreasonable kind of um, mean that it's quite a high bar to get over. On the other hand, I'm not going to pretend that there are not circumstances where um, government policy has been changed as a result of legal interventions. Um, the Limbola case, which was a case where uh, almost axiomatically asylum seekers were forced into destitution because they had to get their claims in within two days of arriving in the UK and get to Croydon, and if not, they were left destitute, was deemed to be contrary to uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, and it led, that was a pretty extreme policy, and it led to a change in, in government's approach. Um, there have been other kinds of cases where you can see around treatment in mental health institutions and laws around mental health, for example, where the Human Rights Act has made a difference. But I don't think governments have been unduly constrained from their policies. Um, and frankly, whether you know this government had been a, a elected, had been a, a, a Labour or a Conservative government, much of their programme, which was markedly different, would have been able to be implemented within a Human Rights Act, and I suspect would also be able to, to do so within a, um, a Bill of Rights. Finally, kind of COVID-19 and, and the kind of exceptional circumstances, the kind of things that we find ourselves in now. Two things to say around that in terms of, I suppose, a rights-based approach. One is, in human rights terms, there are circumstances clearly where um, you can, if much, a lot of, of particularly the qualified rights, you look at issues of proportionality, does what a government or a public authority do meet a pressing need, a legitimate aim, 
as I say, is it proportionate? Well, in circumstances like we're in now, those are the kind of things that you would take into account. And of course, and, and this should always be a matter of last resort, even within the, um, the convention, you can derogate from part of the, of the convention in certain circumstances. It needs normally to be justifiable, etc. So it doesn't hamstring you from the kind of events that we're in now from having to do things that would restrict freedom. Of course, you scrutinise. Is it still proportionate? The freedoms that you're restricting, is there a basis for it? It's not carte blanche to simply um, toss the Convention or the Human Rights Act into the bin, but it does, it does give you the kind of flexibility that you might need in what you might call a national emergency. Um, on, on process, uh, I mean, I think obviously we've had lots of political pro negotiations over the years here, so people know loads about <coughs> process and how it gets on the uh, end. But from the Bill of Rights perspective, in terms of process, um, so the Commission's process was premised upon a bit like the agreements negotiation itself, stage by stage, but nothing was agreed until everything was agreed at the end. Um, and in the end, we had two dissenting commissioners from, from the Commission's advice. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure, looking back with hindsight now, at the process as a whole, if that's what my advice would be, to be quite honest. I think there is value in what Les had say, said, looking at bigger subjects. I think everyone knows where ideological splits might occur on a Bill of Rights. Um, and on those points of principle, I do think it's worthwhile before just wading into the detail of a Bill of Rights, trying to reach some degree of consensus on the bigger points of principle um, to the extent that that can be gained, because otherwise the risk is the process just repeats the processes of the past. Um, there's a conversation about what should be in, what shouldn't be in, votes will be taken, whatever way the committee decides, and eventually the points of principle will derail or run, run the risk of derailing the process as a whole. And, and I think on the bigger points of principle, as Les had said, society is in a different place, even from where we were in 2008. Um, um, and the understanding of what, how those rights, particularly, the, I guess, the, the, the easiest example to pick out is, the, is the, the difference of views with regards to civil and political versus social, economic and cultural rights, and how those things might be embedded in practice. If those hurdles can be overcome, then there's much more hope, I think, of reaching a consensus with regards to what the content should be. Um, and without going into the detail too much in terms of COVID-19, I mean, it was something the Commission spent a long time looking at, the, the technical aspect of a Bill of Rights. Um, I, I'm, I'm really glad the committee has been created, to be honest, because any time I've been engaging up until now, a lot was said after the Commission provided its advice in 2008. Um, but as I've said before in public forums, never once since 2008 did individual parties or collectively people interrogate the Commission's advice. So I'm hoping, uh, to be honest as a committee, that you can get to the stage where the, the big issues can be discussed and you can get into interrogating exactly that sort of question, derogation, what does it look like, you know, when do rights apply and when is it okay for the state to step away. Um, or, or limit the rights, uh, particularly if it's to protect the health of society in this instance as a whole. Those are very interesting questions, mm -hmm. I think. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Carol? So, Les, you've almost answered my question <coughs> in terms of go to 2020 rather than 1998 um, in one respect, but actually, you know, what I'd like to see is if you were to add or change the um, document, you know, what would it look like in, in present day form? And then you start getting into the nitty gritty of, well, what is it we're talking about and what does it look like? Um, because, like, for me personally, I see social and economic rights or, as human rights as well. For example, here, if you look at healthcare, free to point of delivery, but yet and all, you know, just to throw a theory out, if you look at the waiting list and you're putting money into the private sector, um, people are still, you could still argue that people are still getting health and social care support, but it still needs to be a public <coughs> health and social care service free at the point of delivery, which would then go into the realms of social and economic rights, but irrespective of that, 
without, you know, kind of getting into these legally arguments, which I, I'm certainly not qualified to do. But even recently, if you look at the Emma and Jake D'Souza case, I mean, if we had done this work, you know, if only, if only, if only, they may not have been in that position, but we don't know. You know, we really don't know. And we're going to, we're constantly going to be coming back to particularly issues around Brexit that need to be clarified um, much better than what they are at the minute um, because the only way of getting clarification is going to court and that's that's what's happened there in that respect but what, what I would like to know is so you want to get into the nitty gritty of for example the example Paul used around COVID-19 about derogation and all that so where would you start with that? So is it a case that you look at what was provided, amend it to bring it up to current practice? Because we have had, again, three challenges. We've got rights that people felt were really important, like marriage equality, reproductive rights, and so on, so on. And then um, where do you think, in terms of the panel experts from TEO, where does this fit in? Or can we all advise all that? Because the whole point of having a panel of experts is, like yourselves, is to bring forward advice and information. So, because we, we do need to start somewhere, or other ways we're going to be looking at other examples of elsewhere. So, if you were in our position, and I know it's a bit of a, if you were in our position, what would you do? Where would you start? Okay. Um. <clears throat> Uh, well, first of all, if, if I step back and look at, I think you've five advisors to appoint, and I think how you appoint them or... Yeah, do you are, do, Liz? Yeah, do you do. Well, my advice there, I think, would be to say, what is, it, what is the expertise and advice you need? Yeah. Um, five people who all bring the same particular, you know, um, uh, aspects to the table... <coughs> Seems to me to be not not the most valid. So it's kind of interrogating. I suspect in in any discussions you have the TO is, what's the particular expertise you want from these individuals? So rather than a light on, I want you know, and and then work through from having worked through what are the expertise you're looking for, who are the people out there who have those expertise? Um, you don't you want somebody with with a very good sense of the international scene. I suspect you want some people who actually come from an internet subject resources, have the inter not just the international experience in a kind of theoretical sense, but actually are from some of the best practice kind of countries. It seems to me to make sense to draw on some of the expertise that there is in Scotland and or Wales. So it's kind of working through what are the specific expertise that you would find most valu valuable and then try and make sure that when you get whatever process is adopted, you've got people who bring all of that um, expertise in a kind of rounded way to the table. Um, uh, they don't all have to agree on... Um, I would say you'd want people who actually both have an understanding of, of a Bill of Rights from different um, perspectives. Um, appointing five people who think Bills of rights are a waste of time. Clearly, won't be of much use to you. Um, so you need people who who have been steeped in this and can can see and understand what the value of it is. I, I'm not sure how you can. Uh, it's a decision you'd have to make. But the idea of somehow trying to go back to the future and say, well, let's remind ourselves where we were in 1998 and what were the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland then, and pretend somehow the last 22 years, given. We, we had two communities, but significantly, um, and very small numbers of people out, if you like, who were not part of, of uh, migrant and other communities. We're now in a very different position. We'll, we've left the EU when we get through the transition period. The idea that artificially you pretend you're still in the <coughs> European Union because you've got look doesn't seem to me to make a great deal of, of um, sense in terms of trying to come up with something um, so I think you have to start from 2020. Um, there are things then you can draw on. To give you one example, the, the um, uh, rights additional to the uh, European Convention on Human Rights, well, 
the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. The UK Government is committed to um, no longer being um, uh, caught by that. It only applies in, uh, in, in circumstances where EU law applies. But it is the closest thing we have. It postdates um, the uh, 1998 agreement, but it's the closest thing we have to rights supplementary to the Convention yeah. because it incorporates the Convention and then it adds additional rights, right to good administration, some additional privacy rights, etc. Um, the, um, uh, so those are the kinds of areas that I would have thought you'd be able to draw on. Um, so the good thing is this really isn't about starting with a kind of, you know, as I said, a blank canvas and you've got to start writing something whenever, you, whenever you've done that kind of ground groundwork and, and the kind of building solid foundations. There are documents around the world and closer to home that you can draw on if you so so wish and that's kind of where I think your independent kind of experts are the kind of people who would be drawing your attention to here's a good example of something and here's how it's worked etc cetera, etc cetera. thank you the other thing is the um your, your time frame is quite fortuitous because it sets it the, the time frame the UK as a whole different aspects of the UK are moving on similar processes in many ways at the same time so Scotland um, the advisory group the first minister Scotland is now committed um, in terms of uh, giving domestic effect to the two core international human rights treaties within the two-year period that you're sitting as a committee so there's a process running in Scotland um, there's some experience now in Wales in terms of giving legal effect domestically to UNCRC. Yeah. Um, and it, it'll be interesting to see, from your perspective, what's going on there. Because bo both those treaties, all three of the treaties in the, in the regional jurisdictions, are riddled with civil, political, economic, social and cultural rights. So the things that you're going to be playing with um, and considering are, are being considered in that context as well. And the other thing, Carl, in terms of um, in terms of your opening issue about you know considering health, for example, to be a human right, that's what I sort of was trying to get at the last time I'd said about a bit of myth busting and building um, rapport between yourselves. You know, there, there shouldn't be any debate about that issue. It, it is a human right. That's a legal fact. The UK government has committed to those social and economic human rights and treaties, and the courts have been using them since the Human Rights Act came into effect more and more, drawn upon them in terms of case law. There's not a reticence anymore on social and economic rights before the judiciary, necessarily, as there might have been before 1998. Um, and in fact, the vast majority, and the Commission can provide plenty of examples of this, the vast majority of, of issues where the Commission goes to court or supports individuals are actually on issues to do with social and economic rights. You might have to get through the court door in terms of the Human Rights Act, but to be honest, in terms of Article 8, the family and private life, the interpretation of that of the European Court and the domestic courts in the UK is so wide now that almost every conceivable social and economic right can be shoehorned in through Article 8. And as soon as you're through the door of the court, all the international treaties are brought to bear in terms of the arguments that the court will hear, and increasingly so over the years, the judgments that, that the courts will give. But the issue is we're still bogged in court over Article 2 cases, and that's going to be... that It is what it is. Um, I'm not being glad or blasé about it, but the point I'm making is the reason they're in the court in the first place because there's legislation made for them to go there. If they felt that the government or governments failed them. So... The Bill of Rights needs to have legislation, or otherwise it's going to be aspirational. I mean, I mean, really? <clears throat> I mean, I mean, briefly, I've always taken the view, and this might sound strange as somebody who's a lawyer, that actually the courts are the last place resort. of last resort, not yes, first resort. And um, I think one of the virtues of the Human Rights Act has been its help and, and human rights standards. The Commission spent a lot of time working with um, the civil service, with the police service of Northern Ireland and others to look at how human rights frameworks can assist in 
in how they both develop policy and decision making. So it has a role in terms of a framework for um, policing and public order. Um, it doesn't provide the answer to um, if there is a dispute between um, a group who want to, to march or demonstrate and a group who want to prevent that. It doesn't, it doesn't provide an answer, but it provides a framework from which you look at how you deal with, with competing rights. For the civil service, it provides a framework around how uh, you can look at policy making decisions, not in a defensive way of preventing, but actually using some of the concepts like, as I mentioned earlier, you know, a policy should have a legitimate aim. Well, what is the, have you got a legitimate aim? Is it, uh, is there a pressing social need? Is the answer you've come up with proportionate as opposed to, are there other ways you could do it? There's a framework there that if you use that framework, it, I think it can make for better both decision making and policy making in a way that's perfectly compatible with, with most governments' desire to, to deliver um, certain economic and social policies and can then withstand kind of course. So we do see a Bill of Rights as something that is much wider than just the courts. At the end of the day, I think there should be an element of justiciability to to a, um, a Bill of Rights, but we don't see this as being the be and all and end all of a Bill of Rights is about how many cases go to court as a result of, of whatever Bill of Rights Northern Ireland has. It's, much, it's looking at that much wider set of, of but processes. But the framework's really a guideline for people. It, it, it is, and it's not going to take... Um, you and all of the political parties will still be, in terms of the, the devolved responsibilities you have, in terms of the difficult decisions around resources, etc., that you have to make, you will still be driving forward policies it won't be driven forward by um, uh, judiciary etc that's not been the experience even exactly. in places that have had very radical judges in, in kind of South African constitutional court um, they have still operated in a way that has played significant deference to uh, political systems rather than judicial ones yeah yeah far enough thank you any other members have Questions? No? Thank you both for your presentation. Thank you. We'll let you. Yep. Sorry, Chair, Chair, can I just ask a quick question? Are, are you going to send free information about those um, reports? Yes, yeah, they'll come out on Thursday. Given the circumstance that we're in, our intention is not to um, kind of do the normal, much, much more public kind of facing given the mm -hmm. circumstances we're in, but we. Hopefully, uh, the work of the joint committee of ourselves and the Irish Human Rights Equality Commission, and the intention is to um, put them on our website, issue a statement. So, but they are examples in terms of identity rights, for example, where particular circumstances of Northern Ireland and the issue of kind of EU citizenship rights, etc. They're, they're the kind of issues that it seems to me a Bill of Rights would want to to eventually interrogate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. And good luck with your work. And please feel free to draw on us as best as best as you can. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Like in your social distance as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying your best. Just when you're sitting there, you're very close together. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. So. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So, members, if we want to move on to um, agenda, agenda item number eight, um, this is just in reference to a conversation that we've had at the last meeting about some training options as a response to um, Paula's request for training. Um, the clerk has drawn up some options. Um, if you want to have a discussion, I would almost be inclined at this point, given the uncertainty of the, of the time ahead and the fact that we don't know how much longer we're going to be up here and, and what's going to happen. I don't know if people want to be setting plans in stone. If no. I think that's right. I think that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Are you content enough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm absolutely. It's sad. So it's like, no. Yeah. Again. So um, I know, obviously, that the, the work of the committee is urgent, but it's not essential at, at 
at the current time with everything that's going on. So if we can look at that again yeah. uh, and revisit it, and then that probably follows on then with item number nine in terms of the forward work program. So we have between pages three, three, two, and three, 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 we have um, a, a timeline set out. The next meeting is set for the second of April. Can we play that by ear? Yeah, I think we should. Um, I know that there, there are plans in place there for witnesses, but obviously we're not even witnesses' presentations, but we may not still be here at that stage, so our members content. Yeah, it's just very... We take it as it comes. In place yeah. the times we're in. Yeah. So... Can sorry. I just... So see from those um, presentations we've had today, like, is there any way that we can maybe even add onto that, like, the Scottish and Welsh, some of the concurrent work that's going on, I think it'd be really useful whether it's a briefing or, or getting them Skyped in or whatever, I just think yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, I think it'd be yeah. useful that, that they would yeah. contribute, because obviously they're having to deal with the um, Westminster legislation and stuff as well. So. Mm -hmm. so the date, time and place of next meeting, it's set for 2pm on Thursday the 2nd of April in the same room. Oh, um, I, I had some uh, another yeah, business. I was going to ask, uh, I know we've got a brief in there meant for the 23rd of April around the expert panel, but are we getting any indication from the executive office that that process has started? I'm conscious that things could, you know, they could be starting to join us when we're a long way down the line. I think that that might mitigate against not getting the training at this point, but if we had the experts in, around the table. So just to say there's any update on that. From from what I have heard, I don't no, think that it's taken a back seat with yeah. what's happening at okay. the minute and obviously the officials and the executive office are, are flat out trying to deal with the queries so I mean I suppose we could contact them for an update um, yeah. that would be the yeah. yeah we can write to them and, and ask what the crack is agree. thank you very much alright if everyone agrees with that yeah. can I just ask just in relation to getting our papers I know obviously it was difficult this week because we it was an issue with our technology but if we are going to meet every other week, rather than leaving it to the Monday before, would it be possible to get our papers slightly earlier? Because obviously we got quite a lot of papers in advance of today, late yesterday essentially. So I, I found it a struggle trying to so read everything. And it, was quite, it was quite difficult, but it's just really, yeah. it's not a criticism because I understand the situation yeah. that we were currently in. But just moving forward, just consider that in advance of yeah. the meetings. I had asked this it was in terms of the other mm -hmm. both members are free it's usually three working days before but we can move it before well i'm happy with that to think yes yeah, it's, it's just that there's there's a bit like i'm still i skimmed read skimmed read a lot of the stuff just because of time then we're back to reading it last night and then we're back to reading some of it today and it, it just felt a wee bit you might need to do it anyway given the volume you wouldn't mm -hmm. but still it would just be quite good to have it in advance of a weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. If there is a volume. We could ask for the Friday before. It's an exciting weekend, Michelle. I know, but at the same time, it's just about trying to make sure that <laughs> no, they're you're absolutely well, right. rather than because we get caught up in the start of a week. Mm -hmm. Thursday. Aye, uh, it'd be great. Because, yeah. like, once Monday comes, it's like everything yeah. else. Just grand. Okay, is that all Thank or you. any other business? So, yeah. right. Thank That's you. That's us. Red button off. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.